Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Khair. Good evening, everybody. My name is Abraham Sway. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live from here from Amman, from the Farah Medical Campus. Again, the battle drop here is Wadiram in Petra, one of the most elegant places to visit in Jordan. That's a beautiful picture. Also the and very, very nice uh, sceneries there. Invite everybody from outside Jordan to visit. And there are some fancy places to stay in Wadiram. Our topic for today is Kabarnama, affecting optic chiasm. <laughs> from the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological sites. Uh, to speak about cavernoma, I have to take the general overlook of vascular lesions. That is according to the International Society for the Vascular Anomalies classification. So vascular lesions are either neoplastic or non-neoplastic tumors or vascular malformation. Vascular tumors like hemangiopericytoma, hemangioblastoma, meningiomas, etc. And these are the non-tumors, non-neoplastic vascular malformation. If we take the vascular malformation and classify them according to the function, they are either with shunt, arteriovenous shunt, or without arteriovenous shunt. The with arteriovenous shunt are AVMs, fistulas, and venogallin angles. The ones without shunt are cavernomas, which is our topic for tonight, capillary telangiectasia, developmental venous anomalies, and sinus pericranial. Just to remind you about sinus pericranial, the connection between the outside and the inside veins of the brain, capillary telangiectasia like this one, and the DVA or developmental venous anomalies which will take some uh, few slides for tonight because they are important. <clears throat> so back to cavernoma. Old names for this cavernoma, this is acceptable term nowadays. Everybody accepts this terminology. No one at all is using these terminologies, but we have to mention them just in case you come across them. Cryptic AVM, and cryptic means that you don't see them on angiogram, occult AVMs, you don't see them on angiograms. Cavernous malformation, occult malformation, cavernous angiomas, cavernous hemangiomas, all are obsolete names. So what is cavernoma? Why did we choose to call it cavern? Cavern or liqueurs, spaces, like caverns, are angiographically immature, thin-walled structures. They do not contain brain uh, parenchyma, and they are low-flow lesions. So they are multiple spaces, multiple sizes of spaces filled with the blood. But they have this ability, endothelial proliferation, and increase the new angiogenesis. And that's why the vessels are fragile and they can bleed. So cavernomas are tangled of vessels which resemble blackberry. If you like blackberry like myself, you would imagine what is the cavernomas. People think that the cavernomas don't have arterial and venous supply. They do, but they are so tiny you don't see them on angiogram. These are some of the uh, cavernomas that I removed. The, out of the cavernous, uh, out of the malformations of the brain, they constitute 2 to 17 percent of all the vascular malformation of the CNS. They could be single, solitary, or multiple. Solitary is more common, two thirds, one third. Funny enough, the solitary ones are middle aged and the multiple are young age. No sex predilection. And this second to the fifth, but beware, they can affect pediatric age group. So this is collection of pediatric covered nose. And what are they? In the brainstem. They love to go to the brainstem in the pediatric age group for no known no reason. And this is very important. 
So the association between carbonomas and developmental mean summary is to be remembered, especially by young students. <coughs> so uh, we will suspect that if you sit in children and in adults, the developmental venous anomalies, but this is one patient of mine. Uh, Bahrani boy, 11 year old, came with a sitner palsy on the right side. He's looking to the right side, his left eye is moving, his right eye is not. So it's sitner palsy, and this uh, uh, cover number on the right side of his pons. And look at the developmental venous anomaly. So, and this is for humor one. Initially, all cover normas were thought to be congenital. There is evidence now they can be acquired. And this is of very importance regarding the insurance companies. Insurance companies don't treat congenital anomalies. They keep telling, asking me for reports that this lesion is congenital. And I say, no, this is not congenital. It could be congenital, it could be acquired. <coughs> so be aware of this because usually insurance companies, they don't want to pay anything. So there are genetical familial uh, connection there. They can come after radiation, they can come after bands infection, they can be more in females due to hormones. So they can be inherited. And the side of inheritance is autosomal dominant and different genes have been identified. Here is the work of Sam Awad, my dear friend in the States who has you know, spent his life working on this. Is one of the big shots in the United States. There is no problem. So <coughs> Maybe I'll, I'll put it wrong. So inherited, and it is it is common in Hispanics and Mexicans. It could be acquired like this, and usually when they are acquired, they are multiple. So this is a kind of familial covered normal multiple small ones. So they are related to radiation. You give radiation for malignant tumor, for leukemia, for whatever, uh, uh, mythological or brain tumors, and then you will find when we develop covid now. Or you develop it, as I said, de novo. This is in Maya Maya disease. Another one, de novo, in existing developmental venous anomaly, the association which we mentioned. So they can be congenital, they can be hereditary, and they can be acquired. Multiple cover normas are less than single ones. Single ones are more, as you said. But this is important. When you have multiple, 50 to 85 have the familial type. So you have to do some uh, counseling, genetic counseling. This is kind of multiple cover normas. Uh, this is a paper uh, from uh, from Finland, uh, long-term outcome of patients with multiple cerebral cavernous. What should you do with this? The papers say you go for the culprit, you go for the big ones if it is causing problem. Finland is very famous uh, in neurosurgical vascular center. They have in Finland the highest rate of subarachnoid coverage in the world. So if you want to train in vascular neurosurgery, you go to Size could be small, could be large, could be giant. I'll show you two giants in my cases, in my series. This uh, girl, 21 year old, who had a story that she was neglected in treatment in governmental hospital. So she went to the radio stations and she announced her problem. Uh, she was here by Queen Rania. She was referred to us and we operated upon them with this giant uh, cavernoma. So the idea that cavernomas come small is wrong. They can come in giant size. Last week, just last week, we operated on this giant uh, young man, 27, coming from Hebron, from Palestine, with this giant uh, cavernoma. So the question is, can, those, can these cavernomas grow? Yes, they can. They grow because there is interlesional hemorrhage inside the hemorrhage inside it, or the vessels get thrombosed and swollen, or by the process of organization and recanalization. So this is a follow-up of this cavernoma that developed into this. So again, can they grow? 
Yes, they can. Different examples. Look at this one going to this size, and this one going to this size, and so on. How do they present? They present with something. So usually they are symptomatic at some point in one's life. But autopsy studies have shown a lot of many people who died of other causes and they were found to have cavernoma. So you may live your life with a cavernoma without it causing symptoms, or it can give you symptoms at some point in your life. The commonest symptoms are seizures, and that's very important in children, or hemorrhage. Of course, you can have headaches, or it can be incidental finding. <coughs> Uh, this paper is important, the importance of seizures in cavernomas, especially in children. So sometimes you do your surgery to alleviate the uh, seizures. The other risk is bleeding. How often they can bleed? The annual bleeding risk or rate is 2.7%. Of course, the rate varies. Some people would get 0.4 to 5, but this is the accepted range for the annual bleeding. It means that after two years, it's double, after three years, it's double, and so on. But if you, if you bleed and you bleed again, then the chances are 5%. And it is higher, the bleeding and the inflammatory, which is the difficult ones, the brainstem ones. And it is higher in deeper uh, uh, cavernomas. So deeper cavernomas, brainstem uh, cavernomas, they bleed more than the others. If you bleed, 80% you would have a transit deficit. 20% you will have permanent deficit. If you bleed again, 100% you will have permanent deficit. That's why we have to treat these cases. You don't want people to live with permanent deficits or die out of it. Now, this is an important issue, and I think it is misunderstood by many doctors and by many practitioners. The hemorrhage in a covered normal. The people assume that whenever you see hemosedrin around the cavernoma, that this has bled, it's wrong. You may see this without a bleed. So to define a bleed in a cavernoma, this is the acceptable uh, equation. Either there's acute or subacute blood located outside the hemosedrin ring. So you would see mixed signals, hemosedrin ring, and then there's a bleeding outside. So this is definite proof that you have bled. Or there is increase in size in the uh, lesion, 20%, and it is associated with mass effect or edema, like this case. So there's a bleeding outside, and there is edema. Cerebral venous malformation, natural history from Canada, Toronto. And this is the edema again. So whenever you see this, you will say there's a bleed. But not everything you see with hemosedrin means that they have blood. Where do they occur? Locations. Anywhere, they can affect the orbits. I've done many, many cases. In fact, the commonest uh, orbital tumor I've done is cavernoma, and in many other people's series, it is the commonest tumor. So, cavernoma. It can be done by the ophthalmologist, it can be done by us as neurosurgeons. Uh, so it can be anywhere through the brain, but supratentorial is far more than infratentorial, which is lucky because infratentorial is have difficult ones. Supratentorial, again, they could be superficial or deep. The commonest affection, frontal, more than temporal, more than parietal, more than occipital. So these are, this is one of my cases, this lady with this huge cavernum and after surgery. Frontal, frontal, deep frontal, inside the ventricle, inside the ventricle, and so on. Another patient of mine, two years. Two years, male patient with this medial temporal cavernoma. So, different locations. Occipital is rare. You can identify them radiologically. Yes, I'm, I'm coming to that. <coughs> this is a very rare, a rare paper, actually, that they can present like a meningioma, like a dural based lesion. So the surgeon who operated on this thought that this is meningioma, it is dural based, it's metrating the bone, eating the bone. Now, as you reflected the one flap, the tumor is inside, but it turned out to be 
Okay, but no. Or it could be intraventricular, as I said, and all ventricles, lateral, third, fourth, like in this case, in the third. And the range stem, as I said, infratentorial. And this is a paper from Solomon in New York. Range stem. And midbrain, of course. This is midbrain. Different parts of the momentum, tegmentum or the uh, posterior part. Tectal plate. Look at this, affecting the tectal plate. Or it could be in the junction between midbrain and the pons, affecting pons and midbrain. This is total pontine inside the pons. This is one patient of mine with pontine hemorrhage from Iraq, 32 years old. He kind of came with this uh, pontine hemorrhage. He was devastated neurologically with multiple cranial nerves. I operated upon him. This is the post operative and we sent him home. More pontine cavernomas can be in the medulla, which is a critical situation. So, medullary cavernomas. Again from Finland, spinal AVMs. This is the case of mine, a lady from Emirates with this cavernoma inside her spinal cord. Images, one. CT can show you this as hyperdense or calcification with mass effect. And this is actually one case I was dealing with as a resident in London. Again, you can see this on CT, but here you can see the developmental venous anomaly. MRI is important, which I mentioned. This is a legion, multiple spaces, different sizes of spaces or caverns filled with the blood, and this blood will change in the consistency, so you will find oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, hemocytin. The presence of hemocytin does not mean that it bled. And that's the wrong assumption of so many people. Uh, so be careful to say that this has bled. As I said, we have the two conditions, bleeding outside the hemocytin ring or increase in size by 20%. Does it explode? I don't willingly. Of course, it is. No, no of course. Uh, it has uh, the hemorrhage is two times, inside the or outside. So just assume that there is hemocytin and that's it. But if it bled inside, it will increase in size. Yes, yes, exactly. So it is really demarcated, interregional hemorrhage surrounded by hemocytin rim, etc. These are the sequences, the flow, the S1, W, the contrast, and this is MRI. And this is very important, gradient echo. It is the best to show the cavernoma and the hemocytin. Yes, I'm, I'm coming to that, yes, of course. And this man came, Joseph Dobromeski from the Burroughs Institute in the United States, uh, a very famous uh, center for uh, cerebrovascular disease. And he said, we will specify this uh, AVM into classification. So it is known as Dobromeski classification. Uh, his associate, maybe his boss, is uh, Robert Spitzler, who did the classification for the AVMs and the others. So he said we'll classify them into type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. This is a subacute hemorrhage. This is different ages called the popcorn. This is a chronic hemorrhage. This is punctate. Let's see examples. Type 1, hyperintense on T1, hyperintense on T2. Acute. So this is a Bromeski type 1. T1, T2, T1, T2. The Bromeski type 2. Which is called different ages, pop core. Examples of type two. Type three is the chronic hemorrhage, black. And type four is punctate, small punctate hemorrhages. So, Zabraneski classification from Barrow's centers. If you do angiography, there is no identifiable arterial arterial veins because. They are there, but they are so small, you don't detect them 
on Andrew Graham and hence the name cryptic avians in the past. Bradley vascular blush, you may see abnormal draining vein, pooling of contrast in venous uh, state of stage. Then came this, susceptibility weighted, which is unique and it topped everything, it topped even the ingredient A2. A lot of people don't know what this image is. It is called a secretly weighted image, where you see these blood vessels in a very beautiful uh, way. And if you put one of these in an, uh, an exam, in neurosurgical exam, nobody would answer it. So look at this T2 here, the echo gradient here, and susceptibility here. Look at how you see also the uh, developmental venous anomaly. Again, look at here how you see the details of the legion and the draining veins. And then, if you want to have more information, you will do tractography to see what is the relation of the legion to the main tracts. So this is one of them, this is a cavernoma, and you want to see each tract where it is in terms of the anatomy. So what is the management of these cases? Some people would consider conservative management. I do sometimes for certain conditions, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss, but very few. Microsurgery is the best, radiosurgery is big no. It's a big no. I say it loudly and clearly. Big no. You should not. What do you mean by conservative? Conservative that you... Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. They'll come to you, especially in the incidental uh, cases, and then patient has no has no symptoms and no no problem or incidental, then you would say I will wait. Because surgery entails risk. So you would say surgery entails three to five percent risk, incidence of hemorrhage and so on. So it did not bleed before, so you may consider to do that, especially if it is deep seated. Radio surgery, why why I'm saying no. I'm against calling it gamma knife. It is radiotherapy, stereotactic radiotherapy. Let's face it, there's no surgery in it. So people who say, I am a radio surgeon, they are giving them the name of a surgeon, and they are not. They are radiotherapists, they are not surgeons. But even that, how would you know that you have treated a lesion which you cannot see on angiogram? This is one point. Bullock in States, Carson in Karolinska Institute, two famous places for uh, stereotactic radiotherapy. This is a very famous paper by Carlson and his colleagues in Karaniska. I trained at Karaniska, so I know them personally. Uh, they treated 22 uh, cases with gamma knife. Nine bled after radiosurgery. Eight, they had complications. So really, he would say 17 out of 22 had problems. So results of radiosurgery are inconclusive. And remember, you have to wait for three years to see what's going on. Uh, when you say surgery for cavernomas, immediately comes to your mind Robert Spitzer. Robert from also from uh, Barrows uh, Neurosurgical Institute in the States. And as I said, his, his student and his colleague is Zebra Meski. And here he wrote this paper about brainstem. In fact, he, he authored a book on this, which I have. So this is Robert Spitzer. <clears throat> we are here together in many places around the world. In this particular instance, I was lecturing, he was there, and he killed me with his questions. Here he is at my home, at my place in Oman. Uh, this is my wife offering him our coffee. Here we are in Oman. Here we are discussing uh, the project in Jordan. And we are members in the World Academy of Neurosurgery. Uh, so I'm proud to say that I'm associated with uh, Robert Switzerland. Uh, of course, he came and visited Jordan and met with His Majesty. I was there with the, with the king. Another name that must be mentioned is Jaha uh, Hernesini from Finland with his colleagues, especially Mika. Uh, Mika and Jaha, if you go for any components about vascular, you will find both of them are there. The transmitting life series is from uh, Helsinki. 
Uh, so they proposed this grading system of brain and spinal cord nerves, 2011, which is acceptable. Grade one, grade two, grade three, grade one, supraventricular with deficits. Grade two, supraventricular with deficits. Grade three is infraventricular. Very famous. And this is JRCD. This is his picture with his boss uh, in Canada. This is him. Uh, in fact, you can't say easily. And in fact, one of his uh, papers mentioned something like 4,000 middle cerebral aneurysms, which is a huge number. He's, he's the most proliferative man in terms of surgery. He would do middle cerebral aneurysm within one hour. Usually, his assistant would open, he would just go and clip it. And he would do with aneurysm things that he would be frightened to, uh, to do. And again, here, he was there when I was lecturing. He's now retired. He's uh, serving in, in China for no money. He's just the government to help him uh, uh, teach the young generation. My interest in vascular neurosurgery is very old. And this is my first paper. And I put this to entice our residents and younger neurosurgeons. 1984, I was resident. Uh, so I, I made this paper, I wrote it, Traumatic Cabinet Cabernet History. And in which journal? Journal of Neurosurgery. Dr. Hamoy, you were there with, London, with me in London, we are, we are studying, etc. To, to be able to publish a paper in the most famous journal in the world, in Journal of Neurosurgery, as a resident, is something to be proud of. And also I published this one, 1986, also I was still a resident. Uh, with my boss, Sean O'Leary, but I've done the whole job. And we reported the cryptic AVMs, or the cavernomes, and the brainstem. At that time, we used to have just CTs, so these are the CTs. Direct approach on brainstem cavernomes, published in New Zealand. So now, the topic for tonight. It's a cavernoma of the optic chasm. So let me just look with you at the, these. Are they common or not? The optical chiasmatic cavernous in general. Uh, in general, cavernous affecting cranial nerves are very rare. But they can be a cause of visual disturbance. And there are some predisposing factors in predisposing symptoms, alcohol, pregnancy, labor, etc. By the way, vascular lesions are affected by hormones in the female, by contraceptive pills, by so many hormones that they use. So hemorrhage could be, uh, this will be due to the man, could be extra-regional or intra-regional, but the extra-regional are most common. So extra-regional is more common than the insoles. And if they are extra, they would have presentation like subarachnoid hemorrhage, or even intracerebral hemorrhage. I'm talking about chiasmatic cavernomas. They can bleed and present with some arachnoid hemorrhage. Surgery here is to stabilize or improve the geodesis according to what you do. Papers from USA 2010, cavernoma information of adaptive pathways and the hypothalamus, uh, analysis of 65 cases in literature, and these are the cases. So I'm not, we're talking about 65 cases in the whole of the literature. The names <coughs> of the authors and the year, and so on. You don't have to read it. Another paper from UK 2008, again, of the chiasm uh, cavernoma. Again, they put the uh, authors. 2014, this paper uh, affecting the optic nerve. And this 2013, also affecting the optic. And paper from China and paper from Germany and from South Korea. So our patient, 44-year-old female Jordanian lady, she had visual disturbance of two months of duration. She went to various ophthalmologists. And it kills me that ophthalmologist does not diagnose this. A young patient with visual deterioration, you have to have image. A young patient with decreased hearing, you have to have image. But we keep 
going around the bush, beating around the bush without going to the actual diagnosis. So, this is an section in the past, nothing in her vital signs, general examination, class comes scale 15 over 15. Uh, I will come to that examination of the uh, eyes, but basically she had like simple hemianobia. There she is, no motor deficits. Her eye movements are okay, so no third, no fourth, no sixth, but the optic is affected. No cerebellar signs um, and no weakness in her limbs. Chest x ray CG normal and uh, blood tests are within normal. <coughs> Imagine, look at this. You can see there is a lesion there. <clears throat> Actually, you can see the gyrus rectus and the olfactory tract, and then the optic apparatus, and there is something sitting there. There's a lot of you, optic nerve, optic nerve, something sitting in the lab. If you hold on, the optic cancer. There it is. Again. restriction and this is the legion. So you have so many differential diagnoses for this, which I will touch on. Look at this. This is the stop. This is the legion. If you follow the optic nerve in the orbit, which is the round one surrounded by the subarachnoid hemorrhage, go deeper, 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 then you find the region. I guess about a minute. What did I say? Fluid. Of course. And you say average. So, again, you can see the region. You can see the stroke and it is sitting in front of it. Here is this uh, fiesta kind of uh, view, oblique view. You come and you see it there. There, 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 and there. It's kind of a somewhat enlarged cell. And I remember in the past when we did not have the MRI, uh, our bosses used to ask us, what is the diameter of this, and the diameter of this, the diameter in the third space, so that you can speak about the volume of the cell. CT, angiogram, takes a clue to aneurysms, nothing is there. MRV, again, nothing is there. So what's the differential diagnosis? Optic glioma. And this is one patient of mine with optic glioma. Circular aneurysm. Lucky enough, I did not have aneurysm lurking in the dark for me there. But circular aneurysm can present like this, exactly like this, like the current now. Macroadenoma of the vegetative gland, especially if you go on to one side, can mislead. Rathke's cleft cyst, look at this. Again, this patient was presented under this roof about a few months ago. You can see the stroke and you can see the Rathke. I put you the pre-operative and the post-operative. Craniopharyngioma, again, patient of mine, 16 group. Meningioma. Optic glioma, as you mentioned. Histocytosis. And again, we presented histocytosis under this roof, and we showed that they love the uh, optic and the, the stoke and the epithelums. Pilocytic astrocytoma. We don't think of these pathologies as if they don't exist. Anything in the cellular area, we're used to common sentences like a cliche cellular, supracellular lesion, a figure of eight. A snowman appearance, this is vegetarian. We have to stop this. We have to be deeper than this. We have to put differential diagnosis. Neurosarcoidosis. Imagine if you give this, Germanite, you will kill the patient. Germanoma, and we presented the Germanoma last time here. I showed you this. And this Iraqi girl, if you remember. Metastasis. Metastasis and the optic chasm, yes, like, just like the, the carinoma and the optic chasm, just the same. They can happen. Why not? 
lymphoma. And lymphoma is always mentioned in this man. And this is not rearranged. I really have to emphasize. This is not rearranged. And it never fails every single time. It's no coincidence. It's no coincidence. So the differential engineering is very wide, and we have really to think about it, and it has to be mentioned. In the report, I say the duty of the radiologist is not to describe what you see. And I'm talking about the army that we have in the army, the army of the Karasana, there is an army of the army. No, we have to tell how many guns are there, how many machines, how many people are there, so that you help us arranging the uh, thing. But most of the radiologists, they say, our duty is to describe not to give a differential diagnosis, I disagree. So uh, what is an oncologist doing in a cavernoma session? This is exactly why. And I can't condemn enough, as Professor Speh has done already, had done already, the, the, the practice of radiating what looks like a cavernoma in, uh, without knowing what this is. You can swear for all practical purposes that these look exactly the same as what we've seen already. And had this been irradiated, this patient would have been denied uh, um, not necessarily a curative treatment, but treatment that would have been radically different and that would have really affected his quality of life. Lymphoma in this setting, radiotherapy first line is the wrong thing unless it's purely palliative and the patient is dying. These patients would need high dose methotrexate or things like that. Uh, metastasis can really look like a vidnoma, and these patients may have. Uh, not been examined properly, and you would miss lesions in the breasts or the testes, etc. I can't emphasize enough that metastasis from the testes or from the ovaries in the brain does not preclude treatment with curative intent, and I cannot really emphasize this enough, which is exactly what leads us to germinoma. These patients with brain lesions that look like germinoma in this case are treated with curative intent. Uh, and missing sarcoid with radiotherapy and letting patient die of sarcoidosis is a crime. Um, knowing that this is a cytoma uh, is important because the protocol is different. Uh, Histocytosis, the treatment is radically different, and if the, you just give radiotherapy to that specific site, the patient will succumb to a, a disease that they should have been able to live with for a long time. Optic lyoma that can really masquerade as such, and meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, Rathke clefts. Um, I cannot emphasize this enough. These are actual cases. And a lot of these would have gotten a label that it, they look like uh, vascular lesions. These are cavernomas sent to radiotherapy, a cystic radiotherapy, or gamma knife, or X knife, or what have you. And they die with the evidence buried with them because we never knew what these patients had. Okay. <clears throat> so I always think of differential diagnosis and make plans to prepare yourself for the ultimate. Confrontation. Consultation, Dr. Rahim, ophthalmologist. Good evening. <laughs> so I had the pleasure of evaluating this interesting lady who is also my uh, relative. So I was involved in every step of management of this lady. Um, so basically, for us, it's a supracellular chiasmatic lesion, whatever the cause. All this differential diagnosis for us is the same. All of them present in the same manner. All of them cause by temporal hemianopia, all of them compress the uh, anterior visual pathways, all of them uh, cause decreased visual acuity and uh, color vision. So our role as ophthalmologist is to detect that there's a problem. This lady presented one month ago to my colleague and he gave her just simple glasses. I think that if he just did confrontation visual field, he might detect something. So our role is to document things and uh, uh, to see the prognosis. So I'll, I'll show you something and we will continue at the end of the, of the lecture. So basically, the, there was more compression on the left side than the right side. There was uh, a frontal defect in the uh, left. Active, I think there was a frontal defect by temporal hemianopia. Thinking of the nerve fiber layer, let's see. So that's what I uh, am showing you. There is still greenish, whitish uh, uh, elevation here, thickening of the nerve fiber layer. And there is uh, here some uh, 
uh, red, red color. So this goes with thinning of the nerve fiber. We tell Dr. Pine that this will not get improved after uh, surgery much, but this is our golden, uh, golden period of interfering. So let's do something and uh, save this, this eye. And I think that's what we did. This is the frank bitemporal hemianopia. Notice that in a lot of um, uh, supracellular diseases, pituitary disease, whatever, uh, the visual uh, uh, field is not only bitemporal uh, hemifield. It bypasses to the other hemifield as well. Uh, it does not respect anatomy much unless it is a pure dissection from trauma, for example. Uh, so let's continue after that. <laughs> so she did not improve from the first doctor? Basically. No, she was treated well, for two months with the glasses, eye yeah, drops, and you name it, and psychological, and you name it. Uh, she was announced threat for anesthesia. This is our constant form, which I keep uh, insisting that we should mention. And this is just some of the anatomy that one has to remember. So the pituitary, the stroke, the nerve, the, the chiasms here, this is the chiasmatic resource. This anatomy has to be mastered if you want to treat patients with these lesions. Stroke, the nerve, the chiasm. So the lesion has been sitting here, sitting in the lap of the, of the chiasm. So, Optic nerve, nerve, and still going to the chiasm. These tiny little vessels, very thin inches. Terrible picture. Yeah. But imagine people do brain surgery without microscope, and patient gets blind because they don't see these vessels. And when they say neurosurgery is microscopic, because they say this is microscopic for old age. And we are young, we can see well. You cannot see these vessels. And we were trained like youngsters on microscope. So that's how people would be blind because of this thing. Again, nerve, nerve, cares, we covered the relation and the ophthalmic artery, Dr. Muhammad al Khatib, relationship with the optic chiasm. Look at this 3D uh, of the optic chiasm. So let's see surgery. <coughs> So here we are, I use the transphasal approach. So you go between the two hemispheres. I do cut the superior sagittal sinus at its most anterior parts. I come across the olfactory tracts, which I preserve. I preserve every olfactory tract I'm coming across. Yesterday we have done a case, the uh, optic, the olfactory were not existing. So you can see the black uh, legion. That's it, huh? Olfactory, olfactory, and this is olfactory. This is the optic nerve, cutting the arachnoid here, so that I get more space and see a self drainage. But look at here, you can see the legion. Nerve, nerve, and this is the lesion. Some fibers of the chiasm are seen through. So the white is the uh, normal chiasm, and the black, as it seems through the white, is the covered normal. Now you have to stop and think what should you do now you tackle this. But I am prepared, just in case it was an aneurysm, that aneurysm clips are ready, mounted you know, on the table. If I don't know the differential diagnosis, I would not be prepared. You were saying that it's well circumcised, right? Yes, it is well circumcised, but it is in the chiasm. Mm -hmm. So you have to dissect it of the chiasm, and that's the risk. With these tiny little results that we mentioned. If you can see the extent uh, distance. Yes, of course, you can see it like this. Yes, of you course. can see it? Yeah, you can see it, as I said, these are the fibers yeah. of the chiasm. So you are seeing it through. So it has gone through here, it has yeah, gone yeah, through yeah. here. That's why she has the bitemporal and the crossing to the other side. 
defect. But again, you can just uh, raise the white flag and say I surrender, or you just try to, to help this lady. So I decided to go through that, and I don't look at the clock at all. Uh, there are some surgeons around the world who are, uh, I'm calling them Speedy Gonzalez's. Uh, for them, a neurosurgery is tut -tut -tut and then go out. And this is rubbish, to say the least. Neurosurgery is very planned surgery that takes time and effort. You don't want to stay 10 hours or 12 hours unless you have to. But to do surgery in two hours to say that I'm speedy Gonzalez is nonsense. I received some comment about that from last time when I said that my record in your surgery stands at 22 hours. That was in the past, we were just in the beginning, so we used to take our time. But nowadays, if a surgery takes 10 or 12, it's because it deserves 10 or 12 hours. Yesterday, we have done surgery of 12 hours, yes? So you have to find the plane of cleavage. And there is usually one. This is a benign tumor, so why not? I'm here cutting in the, in the legion. I'm not cutting it through the fibers. But this is a decision you have to make. You have to be brave, and your bravery comes from your experience, from your knowledge. Don't be brave on the expense of the patient. Be brave when you are really prepared from the knowledge point of view and the experience point of view. I said this is interhemispheric approach. I could use it through the terional, but I decided this one so that I would see. Definitely, if I went terional, I would not have the pleasure and leisure of seeing all these uh, information. It is her raising uh, experience. This is a young patient, 40. Her husband and children are waiting outside. And uh, you are thinking of what I'm going to tell them. What did I do? Did I really help the patient or not? I always put myself with the family and think of my one of my letters is inside and the anxiety I feel waiting for a word <coughs> about my patient. Is there a big fever? No, no, it's just the blood inside coming out and with the CSF you have this. Yes. Yeah. I'm just here trying to find the good plan of the cleavage between the chiasm and uh, this. Thing. I'm finding it, so I'm more courageous now. At this stage, I thought, well, I've got that. Always I feel during surgery that I'm a tiger following a deer, and the deer is running around, and I'm following him. At one stage, I feel I killed the deer. I put my jaw on his neck and I am in charge. At this point, I remember I said, I am in charge. Yes. So no speedy Gonzalez is here. Struck the effect of the yes? Yes, of course it is. But you have to find a good plane of the cleavage in the gliosis area. So this is a flattened chasm, flattened, like a chair. So this is kind of the back of the chair. This is the seat itself. It is absolutely, yes. absolutely, it will cut it. So it's total removal. I'm checking here on the stoke and the others. This is the stoke to make sure that I have removed it completely. And hemostasis and so on. Okay. So, so you don't do chaos and make decompose the CSD? No, of course not. Here, Dr. Fossil, this is pathology. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dr. Hassan Fossil, this is the slide. See, this case was the cavernoma of the optic chaos. You can see typically <coughs> huge uh, dilated uh, vascular spaces. With the gliosis, this is the gliosis, and these are the vascular spaces. They are abnormal vascular spaces, not the one that you used to see in good histology slides, and there are small capillaries also scattered, and they are arranged in haphazard pattern. 
This is a typical uh, of glioma, of cavernoma. You can see this is the huge and compressing uh, adjacent glial tissue. And you can see <coughs> how they are really not uh, having a good wall. This is very typical to see not, not having a good wall uh, for cavernomas. Uh, variable sizes of blood vessels and the gliosis around them. Next slide. <coughs> this is the huge uh, blood vessel with the fibrin sometimes in it and uh, dilated vascular spaces. Next. This is uh, CD31. We use CD31, it's an endothelial cell marker. I mentioned before that we have uh, four major endothelial markers, CD31, CD34, and factor A. Uh, we use them to delineate the uh, vascular spaces. You can see uh, there are some uh, endothelial cells uh, in this area, in this vascular space, some endothelial cells. Some of them will be detached because of the dilated uh, uh, wall, and some of them probably they do not have lining this fibrous capsule because of the dilatation. And some of them are complex together as in this area. But this is, it tells you where the, are the endothelial cells are located in this uh, cavernoma. Uh, this is uh, GFAP stains the brain tissue, and this is the negative uh, image, which to show you where this is the gliosis, and these are the blood vessels. And it show you how the, the blood vessels, they are abnormal shape, abnormal located, and they are compressing the adjacent uh, brain tissue. Next. This is S100, I did S100 because S100 usually stay, stay, stay in nerves. But remember, uh, this is not a nerve tissue, optic nerve is a brain tissue. So this is, uh, uh, should, should be negative and it is negative uh, in this case. So this is, we do, we do usually key 67, key 67 usually is negative or below uh, one person uh, in all cavernomas, or most of cavernomas, and uh, as is this case. So this was a case of uh, benign tumor we called it the uh, cavernoma. Thank you. Thank you. So, she woke up on table, fully conscious. No one is allowed to leave the room uh, unconscious or not with it. Uh, if there is a problem, we have to know it immediately and try to deal with it immediately. There's no place for putting the patient on a ventilator. This is the immediate post-operative MRI, the very following day. We don't delay it at all. And this is the patient. And within four days, she was discharged. This is her discharge summary. I keep uh, harassing you about this. Just for the young generation, maybe they would uh, actually insist on doing this. And this is when she came up to the clinic for full up. <coughs> After one year, this is her MRI. You can see the clay has one stroke. Beautiful. Okay. Two years ago, again, you can see. Is there a recurrence for you? Yes, of course. You don't remove them, you will recur. That's why the first time is the best time, and there's no second time. Again, and let's finish. So this is the rest of the MRI. Three years for now. And there's the lady. And this is before surgery, and this is after such. So I asked Dr. Brain to come to compare the preoperative visual status and So her main uh, complaints were uh, visual, and we see the op visual field, and then we uh, did uh, many uh, visual fields on here. For example, this is the report on preoperative. Uh, preoperative, pre then on for uh, March, this is an improvement. Look how it is uh, better. Uh, the color vision is better, visual acuity is better, everything is, is much better. So, and we do uh, progression analysis to see whether there is any uh, recurrence of the disease. Did you get any improvement in the, in the other eye that uh, had the red in the OCT? 
Yes. Did you get any improvement in that? Yes, actually, the visual acuity was 0.7, and it was one after the. the so there was some improvement. Okay. Yes. So there was improvement in the region, which is uh, the usual predictor uh, improved so much. Uh, improved the dramatic. Yes. Yeah, so. Dramatic improvement. So, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? So, there was improvement even in the eye that you thought there might not be. Yes. The idea of surgery is to stabilize. And if you gain something, this is a bonus. Oh, but I don't want to just say that there's a, the, most, yeah, most, the most of the time there's no improvement of visual feel deficit after surgery, uh, and it may increase after surgery. Of course yes. it is, in the hands of the mediocres. Question. Um, I wish for uh, our stay because we may have the answer as well. So there is growing evidence for ABMs and some cavernomas response to some biological agents, especially avastin. What's your feeling about that? So I did not catch that. There is growing evidence and uh, literature that there is some role for some biological agents to keep vascular manipulations, including neuronodes, like Avastin. Yes. So what's your input? And um, I wish Ala comes back and see you'll be excited about this, I guess. I, I know about it, but I don't have any input. But uh, as I said, Hassan, my wife is, is working on this. He's publishing lots of papers on that. But I don't think it is in the practical state. It's just. Uh, it's, 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 interestingly, I think the way people <coughs> found about it is, is people being treated with Avastin for other reasons and having mm -hmm. incidental cavernomas that disappeared on follow-up MRIs. And they are seeing some of that even on the ABMs. So it's amazing where the science is going to take patients away from surgeons and mm -hmm. interventionists and just keep them with medication. Not, not in our time. Yes. 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 Yes.